Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Malcolm Roberts is no stranger to controversy. He's described as a climate change denier and is part of Pauline Hansen's One Nation Party in Australia. He was on with Jess, Pete and John last August, and I'm going to talk to him about the changing dynamics in Australian politics and his ongoing battle against globalist organisations. Malcolm joins me now. Senator Malcolm Roberts, welcome to The Crunch. Thank you very much. What's The Crunch? The Crunch? Oh, it's a a political show that we have on Reality Check Radio, and uh, I'm I'm a bit of a notorious blogger, I guess, and commentator, and uh, this is my show that we have on Reality Check Radio where I sort of like to expose, well, not expose is the wrong word, but have a chat with politicians of all types and explore what makes them drive and uh, what makes them tick and all of the rest of those sorts of things rather than the uh, argy-bargy of normal media-type interviews. So that's what I do. Okay, well, that sounds interesting. And I, and I must say that I appreciate, I don't know anything about you or your show or Reality Check Radio, but uh, I must say that I, I commend you because one of the biggest problems we've got facing this world is the uh, misinformation and disinformation coming from the mouthpiece media, the misery media, the global Yeah, that's media. a good so term. Yeah, thank that's you. a good, that's an absolutely brilliant term. Because that's what they are, the misery media that just focus on. I mean, just doing a little bit of research for this interview, I had a look at the woke Wikipedia version of, you know, <clears throat> what they say about you. They call you a climate change denialist. And <laughs> they, these are all things that I think are, are you know, creditable rather than uh, derogatory. But anyway, <laughs> that, that's the way they go. How can you deny climate change? I mean, uh, you know, really. But but I am a climate variability. I'm pro climate variability. Well, it's, if the climate stops changing, then we've got problems. Well, actually, it's an interesting thing because um, uh, I've been trained in statistics at the University of Chicago, which is pretty well mo- the most quantitative university on the planet. And I I learned the difference. There are two types of variability. There's inherent natural variability, which is exists, you know, day to day. Everything changes from day to day. Everything changes from minute to minute. Um, that the fastest swimmer doesn't swim the 50 meters or 100 meters in the same time exactly every time. There's variability, mm. and then there's process change, which is where there's a step up or a trend going on that is a change mm. of process. So the first one, there's no change in process, but there's natural variability. Yep. The other one is there's a step up or there's a pronounced change. The climate, we've got 24,000 data sets on climate, uh, ocean temperatures, air temperatures, storms, frequency, duration, severity, drought, flood, all the rest of it. There's not one factor in climate where there's been a change. They're all just varying naturally and cyclically. Well, there used to be this website on online that had all of the predictions about climate change, and then it would have all the evidence to show that None of those predictions have come true, but I'm not sure it exists anymore or whether or not they can be bothered updating it. There's just so many contradictions. Yeah. We've been fed bullshit. I don't know if that's a word you can use on your program. It is. I think it is because you're Kiwis. Yeah. Uh, I've worked over there for 12 months and you use the same language we use. But um, there's bullshit driving our health, driving our health systems, uh, our what we call environmental systems in this country, Murray-Darling Basin Water Authority, um, everything, COVID and COVID mismanagement, deceit, climate, uh, yeah, you name I see it, there's that, bullshit. I, I see two of the the dictators of the COVID, um, the COVID <laughs> era were, were recently um, awarded uh, King's Honours in, in, in Australia. Just, you know, I'm just flabbergasted to see that dictator Dan managed to get a gong. Well, what it shows is, I, I don't know who made this comment this morning, but it certainly shows that there's no credibility behind the gong anymore. What what little credibility there was is gone. Yeah, I mean, in the end, he, he resigned in ignominy, but he, he gets an award. It's just astonishing. And then yep. you have a look at the Premier of Western Australia, who is probably even more draconian than Dictator Dan was, and he gets one too. You know, yep. maybe, maybe they should have been honest and said services to the Labor Party. 
Yes, but we noticed that Palaszczuk in Queensland, who uh, was not quite as bad as the two you just mentioned, McGowan and uh, and Andrews, but she didn't get one, and, and I'm wondering why. Um, maybe she didn't pay to the Labor Party. That's the problem. Well, yeah, she was kicked out. The other the other two left. They resigned. She mm. was kicked out. So maybe there's hard feelings there. I don't know. It's a strange oh, well. world, politics. Uh, it is. It's a strange world. Now, one thing I wanted to to talk to you about was the voice referendum in Australia. And, and the reason why that is is that uh, one political party in New Zealand, the ACT Party, led by David Seymour, uh, as one of their election promises, said that we would have a referendum on what the principles of the treaty uh, or the Treaty of Waitangi are. That's a little bit similar to the voice referendum. And there's been howls of outrage from all sorts of vested interests about that and this bizarre claim that there's this sort of octopus-like organisation called the Atlas Network that um, it funded opposition to, to The Voice in Australia and is now in behind the ACT Party and uh, and its referendum, and it's part of a tactic of this you know, octopus-like secret society that isn't that secret after all, but there's all these allegations about the Atlas Network. But how did the... Did the voice referendum change Australian politics? I think it put the Albanese government, yes, to the short answer, it put the Albanese government on, on the dra- downward trend. Um, it showed it was the first startling major change, but more significantly, Cam, it was, um, it was again, there's that word again, backed by bullshit. There was no substance to it. It was all based upon feelings and and emotions and uh, what we should be doing and what shouldn't be doing, what's right or wrong in, in a few, in a minority's opinion. There was no substance to it and the people found that out. So um, we also saw... I don't think the people found that out. I think the government found that out, that the people thought it was bullshit. Yeah, but um, what I meant was the, the government tried to con us. Yeah. And then the, both both sides of politics do it. They try to con us. And they thought they could skate home on just feelings and uh, and labels and denigrating people. And the public said, "Hey, where's your substance? There's no, no substance here. Yeah, uh, the emperor's got no clothes." So that's why it failed because the people woke up. And we also saw a huge referendum result, even more overwhelming than the than our voice referendum. And that was the Irish family and mother referendum. You know, they were very, very strong, well over seventy percent. I think one of them might have been over eighty percent. And they tried to tamper with the basics of humanity, and the Irish said, "Go to hell." Well, the Irish would be very conservative, having a vastly Catholic uh, population. True. I would imagine that would have been, you know, I guess you have a beltway in Canberra and, and in each of the um, state capitals. This is a beltway issue again in Ireland. That the rest of the public said, "No, we're not interested in that. We actually know what's right from wrong, and we're not going to vote for that." Right, and and you're correct about the Beltway again in Canberra. The Australian Capital Territory has about four hundred thousand people, I think, roughly that number. And it was the only jurisdiction in which the voice got up. Every <laughs> other jurisdiction not only got smashed, it was totaled. Uh, well over sixty percent in Queensland, almost seventy percent opposed it. So all the states, the country as a whole, and uh, only the ACT voted in favour of it, which shows you just how out of touch our bureaucrats and politicians are. So David Seymour should really press on with this and I guess reap the whirlwind of public sentiment of people who say that we, we need to put a stop to this ever-changing view as to what the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi are. I mean, for a start, the Treaty, I don't know if you've read the Treaty of Waitangi, it's a very short document. There are no principles in it. But in legislation <laughs> over the last 20 or 30 years, various different governments, either blue or red, have uh, included clauses in legislation that said that this legislation is to honour the principles of the treaty. With no princ- there's no principles. There's three articles of the treaty, but there's no principles that are outlined in the treaty. So it, it was a legislative nullity that's grown legs where we now have various courts in New Zealand, notably the Waitangi Tribunal, dreaming up what the principles actually are, but nobody's had a say on not what those principles are. Well. How well informed is the public? Uh, how well informed? How, how keen are they? Because I, I worked in New Zealand for twelve months in the year two thousand and five uh, yeah. on the South Island and Greymouth, 
Um, and my wife and kids came over for six months of that period, but I loved it. It was just fantastic. They called a spade a spade back there. Um, they do, they do uh, over there on the coast. Um, yeah, it, it was just wonderful. honest Kiwi battlers. They know uh, what right from wrong is. They know what a man is. They know what a woman is, and they won't countenance any of the this talk about various different whoopsies choosing their own um, agenda, you know, gender or anything like that. They just call it how how they see it. Yes, and and there the are two memories that well, two two among many memories. I had many fine memories. They're good people to deal with. Uh, when I first arrived, <laughs> I was in the middle of their union contract negotiations, and I took a hard stance on that. And so they burned an effigy of me in the park, you know. That, <laughs> so um, that, that was one thing. And But at, at the end of the 12 months, um, they had a farewell dinner and um, and the union president came up to me and said, mate, we wish you'd stay. So, yeah. you know, they're genuine people, they're down-to-earth people. But the other thing that stunned me, because Kiwis, I mean, no one can play rugby like you guys can. Right. Uh, you know, you're fierce, you're... you're polished, you're professional. I mean that sincerely. Everyone looks up to the All Blacks. But um, I thought it was a country of no bullshit. And Helen Clark and and her, like, changed the country because mm. there was so much PC, politically correct speech. I couldn't yep. get over it amongst the Kiwis. Not not, not the grey mouth people, no. but New Zealand generally. So I don't know how out of touch Kiwis are with the reality, but I'm guessing it won't take much to bring them back. So, so I'm guessing, I don't know David Seymour, but... I'm guessing if he makes a, co- a campaign based upon fact rather than just gloss, then mm. he'll win it because Kiwis will will want to come home to to the reality. Yeah, I think um, you know you say there's all this PC nonsense. It's been pervasive in New Zealand politics, particularly under Helen Clark, uh, and especially under Jacinda Ardern's regime. Uh, oh yes, and uh, you know her regime saw a Maori renaissance in the civil service where. Yeah, you know, they all change their names to Maori names and open every meeting with a karakia. Um, if you tried to open it with a Christian prayer, um, there'd be howls of outrage, but you call it a karakia, which is a Maori word for prayer, and mumble some things in Maori, and it's all good. Everybody just accepts that because they don't want to rock the boat. Well, the other thing that will give you hope, Cam, is that in, in the European Union elections on the weekend, the conservative parties came out very, very strongly. In Europe, yeah. And, yes. and we also have um, Manuel Macron now calling for a, a snap election. I mean, before the Olympic Games start, which is a real panic move, it must be. So um, people are waking up around the world, you know, gender bending. And He's a cocky little rooster, though, isn't he, uh, Macron? Is he a cocky rooster or is he a puppet? Well, I don't know, but he's... Yeah, he's another one of these short syndrome type Napoleon hey, yeah, types. Yeah, yeah, take you know? it easy, take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Not all, not all of us who are short in stature are uh, uh, have a Napoleonic complex. So I don't know. I haven't seen him, but I just know that what he says is bullshit. Well, he was a bit best mate of Jacinda Ardern, so there you go. Oh, say no more. That's it. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Now, one of the things that you're you know, accused of is being a cooker or being part of the Looney Tunes, be, being part of One Nation. But One Nation seems to be getting a lot of following uh, these days. And I've been you know, looking at those videos that Pauline Hanson puts out, you know, the, the please explain videos. Now, I think they're hilarious. It just cuts to the right to the bone on all of these. And you know, I looked at the one about the Snowy River Powers. <laughs> you know, that, that's the most recent one. 71,000 views I saw on YouTube something like that. Are you getting some cut through with those videos? I can't tell myself because I'm not an expert in that kind of thing and I don't have the data, but um, it, they're, they're very expensive. There's not a cent of taxpayer money goes into it. They're all uh, funded by fundraising. Funded by uh, members? Well, yes, and also donations because yeah. some people want to keep them going. Yeah, um, We've made that very clear. And also funded by some of our merchandise sales. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, so we know that Whenever I go to a forum and I ask people about that, they oh, yes, keep them going, keep them going. They, they love it. And what I like about them, so I don't know if they're cutting through or not, but uh, the response seems to be pretty good when I ask. But what I like about them is that they, they've got a political message. Yeah. They've got a, an educational message about the issue or about voting. They've also got a, a very clever, subtle sometimes, sometimes in your face uh, humour. So they're a very, very clever combination. Yeah, I was watching uh, one of them 
And the the last line was something about don't put any more money up somebody's clacker. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yep, that's true blue Aussie, that is. <laughs> or as, what did you say? Dinky die, don't you? That's right. True blue, dinky die, yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, look, I, I often admire Australian politics from afar and in many respects it's a lot more brutal than New Zealand politics where everyone's rather polite to each other. And I sort of long for the days that, would, that New Zealand starts to have a political discourse that's a lot like Australia where you actually hammer the politicians to keep them honest rather than, you know, playing favourites with them. Well, what we try to do, Cam, is I, I can't make any reflections on New Zealand politics because I was only there for one year. But um, what we try to do is stick with the facts and opinion. I'm saying this in truth, not not in not in uh, in trying to c- come across as I'm a, a smart politician. But mm. um, but when I'm you ask me a question about being called a cooker, I get called lots of things, and my response usually, if I'm able to make a response, is well, you know, that's a label. And re- labels are the refuge of the ignorant, the incompetent, the stupid, the dishonest, and the fearful. <laughs> and uh, and so you, I gave you facts, I gave you logic, I gave you an argument, stitched it together well, and you've come back with a label. If you had the data and the facts and the logic, you would have come back with that and wiped me clean. But you haven't. So thank you. I win the I win the debate. So I look upon labels as a wonderful sign of victory and a wonderful sign they haven't got anything to come back at me with. So I'm fine. Yeah, That's it's like- what I love. But like people on on Twitter or X, as it's called now, they come onto my uh, stream and they say things like, "Oh, you're so irrelevant," and I reply to them, "And yet here you are, <laughs> and yet here you are." That is so obvious. Oh man, no, they can't see that. <laughs> no, and they're writing it. I mean, it's just insane. When yeah. when, when I was first on uh, Facebook, uh, the Galileo movement, which yes. is uh, oh, the dirty Galileo movement, yeah. the secret society headed up by. <laughs> By by um, Alan Jones <laughs> or Andrew Bolt or yeah. whoever. Anyway, fine um, Australians, fine Australians. So uh, uh, I had someone who, who who volunteered to help me because he telling the truth. He thought I sucked at social media, so I just didn't have the touch. <laughs> so I, I've learned a bit more over the years. But anyway, Paul said to me, um, "What do we do about all these trolls we've got on?" And I said, "Leave them be. Let them yeah. let them stay there." And because, you know, we we just hold them accountable. What were the words we use a lot of? Show me your evidence. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. and, and then they'd, they'd come back the next day and I'd say, still waiting. Come back the <laughs> next day, still waiting. And and eventually it changed from, from us um, asking them for the evidence to our supporters trolling the trolls. And so we had hardly any trolls at all. I think in the whole time we had quite a few su- supporters, one of the most engaging social media sites in the country, and yet we had any we only banned three people because there's no point that our best advertisements were the, were the people who tried to denigrate us showing mm. how little they had. So we did the same thing on our Senate page and uh, we get hardly any trolls now on Facebook. Uh, we have two that are resident trolls and everyone knows who they are. Yeah. Uh, we get a few on, on X, but not many. And they usually take care of our supporters usually take care of them. So we, we don't ban anyone or rarely we ban anyone. We only ban people if they lie or are completely disrespectful, mm. um, or yeah. So, so, but, but that's a good a good line. Show us your evidence, or show. Well, my favourite is show us your working, because often you, particularly in the health sector, you know, you'll get the health Nazis that come out and say we want to ban sugar. Then you know, we've got evidence to show blah blah blah, and you go, well, show us your working, and, and they never do. They they never <laughs> tell you that their survey was three people at morning tea in the university cafeteria. Yeah, what I love doing is coming back the next day and said, and just say, still waiting, yeah. still waiting for your evidence, and come back the next day and just say, still waiting for your evidence, and then in a couple of days it's still waiting, and everyone just looks at them and laughs, you know, and and because they haven't got any. Yeah, well, I was sued by three um, health people because I called them troffers, and they said that that was der- um, defamatory. <laughs> well, what <laughs> what did someone say? And he's absolutely correct. You can't give offence, but you can take offence. Well, exactly. So offence is entirely in the eyes of the beholder. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So as I said, you call me a name, a cooker or whatever. Thank you. That's a compliment that says you haven't got the evidence to me. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Now, in New Zealand politics, we've got two major parties. We've got the Labour Party, which is, you know, like your Labour Party, but more woke probably. 
And we've got the National Party, which is the equivalent of the Liberal Party in Australia. Now, and they're red and blue, are they? Red and blue, yep. So Labor red? Labor's red, yep. You know, National's I, I, blue. I, I, I can't, can't resist the interruption here because in so many countries, America, Canada, Britain, Australia, yeah, New Zealand, there are, two, there are only two parties and they're red and blue. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in 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 the, in the US, of course, the Republicans are red. God yeah. knows why. Uh, and the Democrats are blue. Yeah, and the, what I was getting to was that I don't know if it's the case in New Zealand because I don't don't talk about New Zealand in this way because I don't know. But it seems to me that in this country, in America, I think in Canada, but certainly in Europe and certainly in Britain, rather, the uh, there's very little difference between the red and the blue. That very was the little. point I was going to make. Is that I'm known for commenting. I, I, my father used to be the president of the National Party in New Zealand, right? He, he's met John Howard and Bronwyn Bishop and a number of other people, right? So I'm it's steeped in New Zealand politics. Now, I'm not a member of the National Party anymore. I haven't been for 15 years. And my view is that Labour and National are the opposite sides of the same coin. Well, I've got a different saying. Two cheeks are the same arsehole. <laughs> so, and, and I use that publicly and people know exactly what I mean. And, and yeah. that's what we've seen. We've seen their policies are almost identical, Cam, almost yeah, identical. Yeah, you could slide a cigarette paper between them. You know, that's how close they are. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only difference is in perhaps in uh, probably the same as in Australia, you've got the Liberal Party that says that, oh, well, we'll be a better manager of the economy or we'll do things uh, in a more constructive manner. But the reality is, is they're going to do the same things to us and tell us that we like it at the same time. <laughs> I didn't think of that a little twist you put in there and tell us that we like it. But uh, I think Morrison destroyed the Liberal Party credentials over the economic management with his oh, isn't COVID awful? response. Oh, he was terrible. But, you know, I thought that that put the Liberals and Labor on a, on a, on a lower keel together at last. But uh I think Albanese is managing to destroy the economy even faster. So. And it's all, almost like Morrison's only saving grace is he's not Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think Turnbull would have even been as bad as Morrison. But I know what you mean. Oh, uh, it's just a shocker. But but my point is this, right? So we've got two major parties in both countries, same as in the UK. You vote red, you get blue. You vote blue, you get red. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change. Right. Do you think with the results that you're seeing in Europe now and uh, in Argentina and other places where populism, they use that like it's a dirty word, you know, almost <laughs> a swear word, that populism is actually now taking the fore and parties that like One Nation, like yourselves, New Zealand First in, in New Zealand and the ACT Party, minor parties that speak the truth are, are growing in stature. Yes, oh, I'm absolutely convinced of that. In excuse me, in this country, we've got a lot of people walking up to us now saying, "Looks like you're here to stay," and it looks like you're definitely having an impact. Uh, so, so that's that's really um, pleasing to see. Uh, and we can we're, we're getting a lot of cut through with the line Uni Party in terms of Labor and Liberal. Uh, the, the yeah, Uni Party is a good term. That's what I use too in New Zealand. Yeah, so so um, I used to say that the labor, liberal labor duopoly or the lib lab duopoly, okay, but duopoly then implied that one nation was the third choice, and I, yeah, and, and and really what I'm trying to show, and you're doing the same with the uni party, is there's only two choices: you mm -hmm. can have the uni party, or you can have one nation, or you can have uh, New Zealand first. Is it ACT or New Zealand first? Well, we've got both. We've got New Zealand right. first, which is Winston Peters' party. So he's uh you know he's been around for well I think he was in Parliament when Noah was um, the Prime Minister, you know, <laughs> uh, helped him build the ark, and um, he'll probably die in office as well. But um, Winston's been around a long time. He's a populist. He's Maori, but um, he's not woke. Right, a populist is used as a denigratory term, mm. but we actually turn it around. Just say, well, thank you very much. We, populist, as we understand the definition, is put the country first. And so we are very proudly populist, very, very proudly populist. Uh, Pauline, she's highly intelligent, she's highly capable, very determined. Um, there's no clever political philosophy behind Pauline, no intricate webbing of, of, uh, it's of no bullshit, different philosophy. It's no bullshit, as you'd say. Exactly. But what it's very simple. She just says, 
First of all, there's Australia benefit. Is it in the national interest? Yes, it is. Okay, next question. Where's the data? Mm. And no one else in parliament apart from myself says, where's the data? Yeah. They pretend there's data there, but they don't use it. And so that's the, the biggest problem of, of our country is the governance is just so shitty because they don't use data. They don't base it on facts. They base it on opinion. On feels. Well, not only feels, but also on um, newspaper headlines to look good, not do good, uh, and also on the globalist agenda. Then when they base it on the globalist agenda, both Liberal and Labor, they wrap it up in lovely terms to make it feel good. Mm. So, but there's there's nothing. There's no substance to it. It's all filled with truisms that that <laughs> when you actually scratch the surface of them, there's no evidence to support it. You know, right. it's it's like the Labor Party said, "Oh, we've we've invested one point nine billion dollars in mental health." I mean, this is the the joke of it. Politicians saying they're investing in something. I mean, there's no return on that investment. There, there's no maths that backs up what the return is. But they say they're investing $1.9 billion in mental health, and four years later, the statistics are worse. So was that investing? Well, I, I think there are, there are two lines along those that quote, Cam. The first is, we spent $50 billion last year. The previous government only spent $25 billion. We've done twice as much good. No, you've done probably a lot of damage because you're handing out money without any accountability. That's the first thing. You've Which made- fuels inflation. Well, not only the inflation, but you, you also fuel victimhood and locking people into their misery. And the other one is, we enacted 18,000 pages of legislation. You bastards before us only enacted 10,000 pages. Well, you've just stuffed up the economy as well, probably, because of all your overregulation. So there's a misunderstanding of what governments are supposed to do. Governments are supposed to serve people. When I first got into Parliament, my first speech, I started with the words, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia. I got Snickers on the on the Labor Party side who were in opposition back in 2016, and I got some smarter, some sort of not not quite that tone, but disbelief, incredulity in the in the Liberal Party side. In, my job is to represent the people, not just the people who voted for me, but the people of Queensland and Australia. Those who disagree with me as well is to represent their views, and so that's what I'm there for. Yeah, we famously had you know a massive protest descend on Wellington. You know, a lot like the truckers' protest in Canada and and in Australia, and uh, the Prime Minister and every politician that was currently in the Parliament refused to come out and speak to them, just refused, <laughs> and then sent in the stormtroopers to batten, bludgeon, kick, destroy, arrest uh, people for wanting to have a say. To say, I don't agree with what you're saying. Would you please listen to me? You know, they'd lost their jobs, they'd lost their careers, their houses, in some instances, family members through the mandates that said if you didn't get, um, you know, you'd have wives saying if you don't get vaccinated, you're not going to be able to see your kids, um, all sorts of stuff like that that was going on, and the politicians refused to listen. That's a disgrace. I can recall uh, in running coal mines in Australia. I can recall being uh, chairman of the board of a, uh, of a private school, um, a community-based school. And whenever there's a problem, as the chairman or as, the, as the, uh, the head of the mine, you walk out and you stand up and you're held accountable and you ask people to give you questions so that it gives you an opportunity to answer. Uh, and then sometimes it ends up, well, people say, oh, shit, he was, that, that makes sense now. We're going away. They're happy. Uh, or sometimes it's a matter of, hmm, I might have got it largely correct, but I some fine tuning needs to be done, or the message needs to get back to the the people at the coalface, you know. So, so that's why, and I, I'd I'd always uh, made it a rule to go underground and be at the coalface, whether I was a general manager, executive general manager, or mine manager, to be at the coalface because there's only one way to pick up what people are feeling. You can't get it through your middle management and senior management because. They're human and they, they, they lose things in the, in the translation, in the relay. So you have to go down and be available to people. You know, some are going to walk up and say, why did you do this for? You know, and all the rest of it. But you give them an opportunity to cry on your shoulder, give them an opportunity to, to tell you what they think, give them an opportunity to, to listen to what you have to say. And, and people admire that. And they oh, they sure give- do. They sure do. Which, which raises a question. Would one nation do a deal with the coalition to form a government to keep Albo and his crowd out and the Greens? I, I, I'm not the party leader, so um, so I can't give you the official response. I and mean, I don't know what Pauline would say to that. 
Um, mm. I think our approach would be simply we will do whatever is in the best interests of the country. Again, is it in the national interest? Which is the core philosophy of one nation, what's yeah. best for the country. That's right. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing Pauline would either say, ask that question of herself and ask that question of me and the others in parliament, or she would say something like, we'd come up with the conclusion that we will support the government in terms of supply, but we won't necessarily support them on everything. Mm. So in other words, it wouldn't be a strict deal. I yeah. don't think Pauline, Pauline's had major donors come to her and say, we're willing to support you. She says, you know, I won't change my vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they walk out the door. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So, so she's very, very much independent. She will do what, what is good for the people. So I, I can't answer your question, Trisha. I'm not trying to avoid it. Um, I've given you, given you some glimpses as to what I think. That's all right. I'll, or what I'll do is I'll use you to get Pauline on the show and ask you that in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> what about the what about the teal independents? You know those blue green womble types that uh, you know. Are you going to develop some plans so that you can make sure that they don't hold the balance of power, give gifting elbow, you know, another term? You're aware, of course, that David Pocock is a teal mm-hmm. in the in the Senate. People don't see him as a teal because he's he very careful to not mention the word teal. So for your listeners, the teals are people who are funded by Simon Holmes Accord through Climate 200. The teals are known as the teals in the mouthpiece media, the misery media, as being in the lower house only. So mm. strictly speaking, Albanese has a, even though he only has less than a third of the vote in the lower house, he has the majority of members in the members of parliament. He doesn't rely on the teals as a support in the lower house. So he can govern on his own right that way. Where he relies upon the teals is that Labor and the Greens together, when Lydia Thought was still in the Greens, they only had half the Senate numbers. So they needed someone to get them across the line and get into a majority. So they've been stitching up deals with David Pocock. Now, David Pocock has been very, very careful to not call himself a teal. But the man is a teal. The man is funded by Climate 200. He has his teal policies. He has Greens policies. And his policies are ridiculous and very, very damaging. So we call him out as a teal. So David Pocock and the Greens and the Labor Party combined to form a coalition, essentially, in the Senate. And they're the ones that whip things through. Now, what we can see, I don't know if people are aware of it, um, maybe you're not aware of it, but our states have 12 senators each, even the little state of Tassie. Uh, our territories, the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory, which is the cent- which is centred on Canberra, have only two senators each. The, s- the senators from the states are on a staggered term, six-year term, they're elected every three years. So that keeps it, that, that's a good system. The territories are a fairly new addition to the Senate and they only have two and they're elected only for three years. So they're the same as the House of Representatives, if you like. Now, normally in the territory, in both territories, we've had one Liberal and one Labor. David Pocock upset the apple cart and the Liberal got knocked out only by preferences uh, and, and David Pocock got some pretty lefty donations. So David presents as being, you know, a rugby boy and therefore conservative, but he's not. He's a dead set socialist and damaging to the country. Um, and I think you bastards knocked too much into his head, but uh, <laughs> knocked him around a bit too much. Right? He was a fearless player, a very good player. So I've got yeah. to give him for that. But as a politician, his, his policies are hugely damaging to our country. And David doesn't seem to know or doesn't seem to care about that. Uh, he follows an agenda which is clearly from Climate 200 and Simon Holmes, the court's money. So he, he favours the UN, he favours the World Economic Forum policies and is destroying our country. So what I'm saying is that David keeps the Liberals out of the Senate in the ACT. So therefore it's in Labor's interest to, to butter up David and look after him, get him what he wants. And it's in David's interest to keep the Labor Party going because uh, they're aligned more, more with his politics. So we've got a socialist coalition in the Senate. So you're absolutely correct. What we've been doing is calling him out on his policies, calling the Greens out in their policies and calling David a, a teal as he really is. So that's what we're doing with those. Oh, you know, he might have captained the Wallabies, but I don't think he won any games against the All Blacks. <laughs> well, who does? 
<laughs> well, it's a temporary blip. Well, there was a there was in the early two thousands there was a bit of a, a blip there where Australia won a few things, but they they haven't won at Eden Park in quite some time. So thirty you know, something years, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. It's a bit of a fortress. Yeah, rugby's demolishing itself in this country, it seems. But anyway, no, it's I, I play doing rugby the same then. here. I think it's what? become too woke and weak. Rugby. Yeah, yeah. They've got. Uh, there was a big fuss a few years back where one particular player in Wellington uh, decided to go against the owner of uh, of the franchise there and you know, w- wanted to go on about some sort of woke sort of agenda. Um, you know, wanted to wear rainbow socks or something like that. It's quite bizarre, but anyway. I, I can remember um, how old would our son have been? He would have been 12 years old um, and we were in Greymouth. Mm. And uh, I said, let's go up to um, Westport. Yep. And and uh, just for the trip, the drive, and then play some pool and go to a, a restaurant up there. And I'll always remember this. Uh, we had to walk past a table of, of hens, you know, women there, and there's only a narrow passage in between the wall and the chair of, uh, and there must've been about a dozen, 16 women around the table yeah. and nine o'clock at night. And uh, we're walking into the pool room and I overheard the conversation. Are you watching the game tonight? Like it's two o'clock in the morning against South Africa, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone on the table said, yes. I was <laughs> going, what other country in the world would the women be? <laughs> oh, well, those are proper women on the West coast, you know? So Right. And another one I remember um, going into the Christchurch Cathedral. It's gone now, isn't it? Uh, well, it's a pile of rubble, but there's a bunch of wombles that want to rebuild it the way it was, and the the cost keeps going up and up and up. But but we were we went for a tour of the, of the Christchurch Cathedral, and there's only one exit point, mm. and that was through the bookshop. Yeah, <laughs> get sales right. Yeah. And when you entered the bookshop, you turned right to find the path out. You look straight at the cash register in the main counter, right? Yeah. And so I walked over there to say, which is a way out. There's a picture of a coffee table book, Irish, British, British and Irish Lions Tour of New Zealand 2005. Yeah. All right. And it was a fair, fair sized book. It was a coffee table book. And it had pride of place in the whole bookstore. <laughs> I said, mate, I thought this was a religious bookstore. And he said, it is, mate. The religion of New Zealand is the rugby union. Rugby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, for the benefit of the listeners, you've got a, a, a bumper sticker in your background there that says, we love coal, and it's as black as coal. Yeah. So, you know, the question I want to ask you is, does nuclear power make much sense when there's cheaper options for efficient coal? Well, our, our policy is simply use the cheapest form of energy there is because to be competitive, you have to be the cheapest energy. Uh, Australia has been blessed with abundance in natural gas, but but also coal. And we've got more coal per capita than any other country on the planet, I think. And our coal is, is amongst the cheapest in the world. It's also amongst the highest quality. You've got some very niche coals in, in New Zealand, mm. but I think it's in terms of mass production, Australia uh, is the top of the pop. Well, we've got a fair bit of coal here, but our greens um, have the saying, you know, um, keep it in the hole. Uh, and we've got, bizarrely, we've got a major uh, a major power producer that runs the Huntley Power Plant, which oh, yeah. produces the base load for New Zealand's power system. Uh, and... Uh, they import literally shiploads of Indian, dirty Indonesian coal when they're sitting literally on top of several coal mines in the in the near vicinity of that power station. Yeah, and your coal in New Zealand is, is pretty good quality. Mm. We can get back to dirty coal in a minute, but um, what we say is use the cheapest cheapest form of power anywhere because then you can be competitive on a global market. Mm. So my understanding is that hydropower is the cheapest. Not everywhere, but generally it's the cheapest, and you've blessed with that. Yeah. So you, you've got the cheapest there. Well, it's hard to build a dam in New Zealand now because we've got the stupid legislation that was passed by the National Party called the Resource Management Act, which has meant that there hasn't been a single dam built since they passed that legislation because there's always some snail that lives on the creek or the yep. river that they want to dam, or there's a breeding pair of ducks that would be best shot impeding the progress because that's what the Resource Management Act does. It impedes progress. 
similar here in, in, in the States, uh, in, in uh, I think Columbia River, but well, somewhere up in the northwest of the United States, Washington, Oregon, they're actually removing dams. I mean, this is insane. So hydro is generally the cheapest. The second cheapest is generally coal. The third mm. cheapest is nuclear. Solar and wind are not even competitive, not even close. They shouldn't and they don't work all the time either because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Right. So you need four for one. Because the capacity is, is averaging about 23% of the nameplate capacity, you need four just to get your nameplate capacity for turbines or, or yeah. four lots of solar panels. You know what I'm getting at. And, yeah. at, and at peak hour, it's 10%. So you need 10 times as much. And then, as you point out, if you go a few days without sun or without without uh, wind, you might have 10 times what you need, but they're not, not producing anything. So you need batteries, which is, just makes it prohibitive. And then because... Um, wind and solar is scattered, you need far more transmission lines. And then because you need 10 times as much just to get your peak out needs, you need even more or so again. So transmission costs just kill you. So, and what they've done in this country, Cam, is that they, the CSIRO is, is fraudulently putting up studies that show wind and solar are cheapest, but only because all the ancillary costs are not included. Mm. So, so they're far more expensive as we're finding from our power bills. Uh, so we should be going hydro, but we haven't got the water you guys have, so we should be going coal. In South Australia, though, there's an argument that says South Australia's got huge reserves of, of nuclear fuel, uranium. Mm -hmm. We should at least look at the alternative. It might still be cheaper to bring coal in from New South Wales and Queensland, but we should at least consider nuclear. So in some areas, nuclear may be, well be the cheapest, uh, but, but wherever, whatever it is, we should be looking at the cheapest regardless. Oh yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. You know, and you should look at using your own resources before importing them. Right. So we're dependent right now on China. We send them our coal. They're already produced. We we produce about five hundred and sixty million tons of coal. So we used to be the biggest exporter. We're now the second biggest exporter behind Indonesia. We're about number six or seven in terms of annual production. And China is heading for five billion tons of coal a year. Five billion. I mean, it's just insane what we're doing. We have got the world's best coal resources and we can't use them, but we can export them, let someone else use them. I know that's the, that's the, the ridiculousness of the green argument here. You know, we've, we're sitting on mountains of coal, but, you know, we can't, we, we had, you know, just under our dune say we're going to stop oil and gas exploration. We're going to uh, not uh, mine any more our own natural resources, which to me is tantamount to treason and not using God-given resources in a country to benefit the people of that country. Uh, and, uh, you know, they always go on and compare us to Sweden and Norway and places like that, which have got vast oil reserves. And guess what? They use their own oil reserves and they plough it into the social policies that are the envy of the world, funded by industry. But Jacinda Ardern wants those gold-plated socialist, wanted those gold-plated socialist policies but didn't want to pay for it with the resources of our country. It's just insane. That, that's correct. They've done a far better job. What we've done in this country is we have enabled 90% of Australia's large companies are foreign owned. And since 1953, have paid little or no tax. That's not me saying that. That's a quote from Jim Kalali, who was a former commissioner of taxation. So what we've done is we've enabled the largest tax avoider in the world, Chevron, to exploit our resources give us bugger all for it, Cam, and we send it to Japan and they charge $3 billion a year on import duties for our gas that goes into the country. So we're not getting that at all. So we can't use our coal here, but we can send it to China. And we can send our coal to China where they burn it along with their own coal and sell electricity for eight cents a kilowatt hour. We sell it here. We don't produce it. We sell it here for 25 cents. So straight away, we are exporting our manufacturing jobs to China. We're subsidising then with electricity tariffs, uh, raising prices to subsidise Chinese wind turbines to be built, shipped, uh, installed, and then operated with subsidies that drive up our price of electricity, which sends more of our manufacturers to China. So China wins hand over fist. They're not doing anything wrong. They're doing what any smart businessman would do. And yeah, they, it's, it's the arbitrage of it. You know, they can make money off your product. Off our stupidity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, is, it is plain stupid. Um, I, I'm, and I'm not bragging when I say this, that there is really a second message that I'm getting at. 
but uh, I don't know if you're aware of Tim Ball, Professor Tim Ball from Canada. Yeah, I am. Okay, wonderful man. He was the best in the world on this um, climate bullshit. Uh, he said that, I, to his knowledge, I'm the only member of any Congress or Parliament anywhere in the world that has held a government science agency accountable over climate. Now, sure, some people have asked questions in Senate estimates, hearings, those kinds of things, but no one has pursued the CSIRO. I've had three meetings with the CSIRO. They're the government's top advisor on climate. First meeting, they admitted that they have never said carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. So I said, who has said that? Because they're quoting you guys. And they said, you better go and ask them. Mm. But that's the politicians, right? So, that, so it's not CSIRO saying that. Then the second meeting, remember that all this climate fraud was based upon you can tell I'm starting to get wound up here. Uh, but but it's, it's just inhuman what they're doing, Cam. It's, it's, it's vile. Uh, so the second thing was this climate change, before it became climate change, was global warming. Yeah. We were told that the world is going to boil. And so it was all based upon unprecedented, unrelenting, ever-present rising temperatures. And the CSIRO looked at me, and I was sitting next to the climate science head, acting head. We were about a metre apart. And he looked at me and said, Today's temperatures are not unprecedented. No. It's all bullshit. And so uh, the, the prime minister of this country at the time when we installed the worst, the most devastating destruction of our electricity sector and it's now paying off in terms of high prices, uh, poor reliability, was John Howard, a liberal. Every major climate and energy policy was introduced by the liberals, yet the, the, the public think it was the Labor Party. So Howard introduced the most far-reaching and six years after he got booted from office, that bastard said in a public address in London that on the topic of climate science, he was agnostic. He had no science. So the whole thing is a fraud, and now we're paying for it because, the, because our, our inflation rates are very high, our cost of living is very high, and we're exporting our industries overseas. This is insane, and it's all based upon a lie. It's almost criminal. It is criminal because... The CSIRO is, is committing fraud by perpetrating the fraudulent claim that solar and wind, I don't call them renewable, solar and wind are the cheapest, and they're not. They're, they're the most expensive by far. Well, it's like people who say that Teslas are you know, good for the environment. You say, well, where did they get all the cobalt from? Where did exactly. they get all the lithium from? Where did they get all the aluminium from? Where do they? It's all um, from extractive industries. It's, yep. it's, it's just a a snow job, a PR thing. Now, if you said, well, Teslas are technologically advanced and they're this and they're that and all those sorts of things that are true, no problem. But don't make shit up. Right. But in addition to that, uh, there's a basic uh, figure about a Tesla. It costs a lot more than its equivalent counterpart with a petrol or diesel engine. That is because of the huge amount of energy and resources that go into producing a Tesla. A Tesla has a huge footprint in terms of resource use. Solar and wind have huge footprints in terms of resource use. That's why they can never compete with coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear and hydro, because they're just so expensive to produce. I'll give you one figure. What's his name? Alex Epstein. Have you heard of him? Yes, I've read, um, read his books. Oh, yeah. First brilliant book. guy. Oh, yep. Brilliant. Yeah, he's a, he's a lovely man to talk to as well. Got the numbers at his fingertips. He has a figure in his book. What's it called now? Uh, the moral case for fossil fuels. He has a figure in there that says for each kilowatt hour, I think, well, unit of energy, let's, let's just focus mm. on the unit of energy. For each unit of energy from a coal-fired power station, it averages about 35 tonnes of steel. Yeah. For each same unit of energy from, from a, a wind turbine, 546 tonnes of steel. Yeah. You cannot get cheap power for that reason. It is resource intensive. It is energy intensive to manufacture. And it is very, very low in terms of um, in terms output. of output. So therefore, yeah. you've got a very high unit cost of electricity. It's inherent. Yeah, well, I, I you know I agree with you on the, on all of those points. The books by Alex Epstein just make that case that uh, that fossil fuels have have improved the outcomes of humankind exponentially uh, beyond belief than all of these other things that are touted solar and wind and all those things are never going to be able to, to reach that level ever. Well, what, what, what were we, when I say we as humans, as humanity in the Western countries, the, civil, the developed countries, what were we using 
for lighting in 1850. Yeah, that'll be candles. Candles and whale oil. Yep. Coal is the best friend of the whales. <laughs> I'm serious. No, no, I'm, I agree it's, with you. It's a, it's a funny story, but, uh, but yeah. I'm serious. What were we using for uh, cooking and for heating? Yeah, similar products. Timber. And coal is the best friend of the forest in the world. Tim Ball again said, the area covered in f- of, of forest land in developed continents is 30% greater than it was 100 years ago. What's the best friend of the forest? Coal. Yeah, coal. And you've got high density energy packed cool. into a tiny spot and you've got a minimum land footprint on the, on the, on the surface. Nuclear yeah. power plant, a uh, coal power plant or a dam, not so much a dam, but a hydroelectric power unit. You've got minimum footprint on the land. You've got minimum impact on the environment, but you've got above all the number one thing for determining human imprint, human impact on the environment is our energy use. The lower we get our energy costs, the more energy we use, the more energy we use, the more productive we are, the more productive the more we are, we the less, less impact on the environment. I mean, this thing here, my iPhone, yep. has got more songs on it than my entire album collection when I was in, in my teens, you know. Mm. Uh, oh, it's incredible technology, the things that can be done with that, but it all has to be powered somehow, and um, it's not with unicorn farts and, and sprinkles. Not only that. The footprint of this phone is far less on the environment than boom boxes and all the rest of it in the mm. past. Yeah. So, so we've got that, that to be grateful for. But we only get that human progress, the technological progress, the scientific progress, if we decrease our costs of energy. And the humans, since 1850, have been on a relentless decline of uh, energy costs per unit cost until about 1990s when we artificially increased them in the so-called developed and insane Western civilization uh, to comply with the climate madness. Well, I think you need to have a good long chat with Shane Jones, and I think you should give him a couple of those bumper stickers as well with We Love Coal <laughs> on them. He'll, he'll show them off and enrage the green wombles in New Zealand. No end with those, but uh, I think it'd be well worth you and him hooking up at some point and, uh, and, and discussing mining and how... Uh, Australia and New Zealand can move ahead into prosperity by using our own resources. Well, I'd be happy for an introduction if you can give me an introduction and and give him a copy of uh, Alex Epstein's book. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of copies and his second book as well. So um, I haven't read his second book yet. Yeah, well, he gave me a free copy after I uh, contacted him and said, you know, I'm interested in doing an interview. And he says, oh, well, I, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but here's my books. <laughs> so I ended up with two signed copies of of well, both of his I, books. I, I so. did a podcast with him and with uh, about 17 other climate uh, skeptics and economic climate skeptics. And uh, he said, Yeah, I'll give you half an hour. And we didn't stop for an hour and a quarter. Oh, I know. I know. He's, he's, he's brilliant. Wonderful. And, and he's got all just, the facts. Oh, impressive young man. Well, we're up against time, Malcolm. And uh, it's been fabulous having a chat with you. And um, I'm sure the listeners of The Crunch will, will enjoy that. And of course, you were on earlier. Or late last year, and or in August last year, with uh, Jazz Preet and Don, and uh, oh, yeah. had a, had a bit of a chat with them. Uh, they don't believe in the climate bullshit either. Well, they're using their minds and their, their heads. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that's what we're all about. So it's been a real pleasure having you on the Crunch. I've enjoyed it, Cam. Thank you for your time, and uh, we'll touch base again on uh, what's happening in Australian politics. Sure, happy to, and and I or mean what I said at the start. This very very important role you've got because we've got to get people off the mouthpiece misery media and onto the reality. So thank you so much for being an independent podcaster. Oh, you're an very independent welcome. broadcaster, actually. Broadcaster, yeah. Well, that was an enjoyable interview with Malcolm Roberts. He's a true blue Aussie politician who puts his country first, and he certainly calls a spade a spade. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. 
We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.